And well, as you turn in your Bibles, Psalm 46, verse 10, Psalm 46, verse 10. You know, as I have sat with you, talked to you on the phone, emailed with you, texted with you, gotten to know, yes, even if I can just be honest, pastors Facebook stalk their congregation, so be warned. <laughs> I've seen you post some hurts. I've seen you post some pains. The fathers, the children, the brothers, the sisters that aren't there this holiday season. As I just go through my phone and I look at, at your, your entry in our directory and as I pray for you, there are times where I feel your loss, I feel your hurt, I feel your pain and I don't want someone to walk into my office because I'm watery eyed for you. As I've thought about this, and thought about the stresses that come this time of year during the holiday season, I think the number one thing we need to hear this morning, the best words we can hear are these words of Psalm 4610. Be still and know that I am God. Say that with me. Be still and know that I am God. Have the stresses of the holiday season kicked in yet? Anyone feeling them yet? Did you know that 88% of Americans report feeling increased stress, increased stress during the holiday? I'm so stressed, I can't even say it right. Increased stress throughout the holiday season. 88%. Isn't that kind of a no duh, Captain Obvious statement to make, right? We all feel it, we all know it's there. There's really a lot to get done this time of year, isn't there? There's the grocery shopping, there's the gift shopping, there's long lines wherever you go, there's full parking lots, people trying to steal your space that you've been waiting for. Anybody have this happen to them? Yes, this happens. Grace, there's multiple evenings taken up with work, with family events, with school functions and all other kinds of things. This can be a very painful time of year on top of all of the added stress of trying to sync everybody's calendars and schedules up. It takes a toll. What do we do? How do we manage this? You know, if you listen to the secular counselors, they're full of all kinds of hands-on wonderful wisdom. You can read their blogs, you can read the New York Times where the mental health counselors tell you, do this during the holiday season. Here's what they say. They see things like, you need to set a budget. Yeah, that's not helping, right? Start saving in October, more like August. Set personal boundaries with your family. Know what you can handle and know when there is no more. Engage in self-care. You know, they're not wrong. I don't wanna be cynical. I don't wanna like make fun of them. They're smarter than I am, but that feels like it doesn't go deep enough, no. What we want in the holiday season is not to manage them. We wanna grow deeper in our relationship with the Lord God. We wanna know that he's in charge. We wanna know who this Prince of Peace is and if he will really bring peace to us. Well, to get the help and hope from our God, we go to him in his word and we need to heed the call of this text this morning. Be still. Does that already sound like more work? <laughs> Be still and know that he is God. We all need this call no matter how busy we are. We need this call no matter how impossible being still seems. King David was a man who knew great stress. He knew great tragedy, yet he knew the importance of being still. And as we go to Psalm 46 this morning, here's what we're going to do. We're going to use verses one through seven to really put a magnifying glass on verse 10. We're gonna use those verses to unpack this call to be still, but we're also gonna use the lens of David's life and we're gonna see tragedy, stress, heartache, all the things we experience in his life and we're gonna see how he handled it and how that helps us. In fact, let's go to Psalm 46 now. I'm gonna read verses one through seven and verse 10 and we're gonna see how this text helps us to be still. Psalm 46, I'll start with verse 10, go back to verse one. Be still and know that I am God. Back to verse one. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. 
There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Be still and know that I am God. Now, how are we going to get at this? What hope and help is there? I see three things that we need to take away this morning as we learn to be still. Here they are. Here is your outline. When you are still before the Lord, the first thing we're going to see is this. When you are still before the Lord, you find refuge despite your sorrows. You find refuge despite your sorrows. What is the second thing that you're going to see this morning? The second thing is this. When you're still before the Lord, you find belonging despite your loneliness. You find belonging despite your loneliness. The third and final thing that we will see is this. When you are still before the Lord, you find grounding despite your anxieties. Refuge belonging and grounding. Let's look at refuge. Let's look at refuge. Go to verse one. Go to verse one. Do you see where David says that the Lord, our God is a refuge? He is a shelter. But we've got to ask how deep of a refuge, how strong of a shelter. And that's what verses two and three do for us. Let's look at them in a minute. But first let's look at this. Let's look at this. David was a man who needed refuge. David was a man who needed shelter. Let's see this in his life. Did you know that in David's earlier days, his father-in-law, King Saul, gave his wife to another man? Did you know that in his middle age, he lost his best friend, Jonathan, in battle? Did you know that in his later days, he lost one of his children in childbirth and two of his sons were killed and murdered? David was a man who knew what it was like to have his world turned upside down. David was a man who needed refuge and needed shelter in the midst of sorrows. Yet David is a man who could be still. He could find refuge in his God. Let's look at verses two and three. Let's unpack this. Let's look at that. Look at verse two. Do you see how David is painting a very stark picture there? Do you see how it's almost apocalyptic? I mean, the mountains are scooped up and dumped into the sea. You and I kind of have categories for that. We've seen avalanches, right, in Alaska falling off into the water, and it creates a tidal wave or a tsunami in another part of the world, but that's actually not deep enough. Let me show you how a Hebrew man, let me show you how a Hebrew woman understood the world. Let's bring this picture up. You've seen it before as we went through Jonah. Do you remember this picture? This is how they understood the world. The earth was a flat piece of rock and the waters roiled below them. There were pillars driven down into the foundations of the earth. Now, with that picture in mind, do you see how when David says, the mountains fall into the sea, what he's saying is that the world is literally turning upside down. The waters are on top, the mountains are below. The world is inverted, it is being turned upside down. David is saying that when the world is caving in on itself, when his world is topsy-turvy, even in the midst of sorrows and pains that turn life on its head, he knows that he can be still and find that the Lord is still a refuge that he can turn to. All grace. There are those of you here this morning who know sorrow and deep pain. I know that more than one of you have lost a parent in the month of December. I know that some of you lost a parent, but your parent's birthday is in the month of December. More than one of you have lost a child in the month of December. And even if you did not lose a loved one during this time, you feel it harder during the holidays. Some of you, some of you are watching your loved ones and you feel like they're just throwing their lives down the drain. Some of you have known, oh Grace, some of you have known abuse and degradation at the hands of another. 
Like David, many of you here know what it is like to have your world turned upside down. And during the holiday season, it hits harder. This is the season where we're supposed to be full of joy, full of warmth, full of cheer, and to know the absence of sorrow, and it's not working, it's not landing, it doesn't deliver it. Oh, Grace, in the midst of your sorrows, you need to hear these words. Be still and know that the Lord your God is a refuge. Please, Grace, do not try to hide or stuff your sorrows or pain. Do not put on a brave face, no. Embrace your sorrows and take them to your Father in heaven. The Lord your God really is a pillow that you can cry into when the pain hits. The Lord your God really is a roof over your head that does not leak or does not drip when the fiercest rains come. The Lord your God really is strong arms wrapped around you that do not sway and do not rock no matter how hard the windy gale hits. That's what it means that he is your refuge and he is your strength, your present help in time of trouble. The Lord God acts as your refuge. He shields you and he keeps you even when it doesn't feel like it. Oh, Grace, take time to be still and reflect on the refuge that he offers. You will feel his refuge. You will feel his shelter and it will bring you comfort even in the presence of pain. Now let me ask, a lot of you know that, I know you. A lot of you know that, you're like, are we really paying for this? So let's ask this, how can you trust that? How can you take it to the bank that he really is a refuge? You know that he is a refuge because he is the one, the true and better David, he is the one who left heaven for you the very one who helped create those mountains that tremble and those waters that roar came to be still in the manger for you. Go with me to Mark's gospel, go to chapter four. The one who came, the true and better David, had a time where tall waves roared and they tried to strike against his boat and sink the boat that he and his disciples were in. Jesus was fast asleep and they woke him up and what did Jesus say? Be still. He said, be still to the wind and wave, and they knew that he was God, and they obeyed him. Jesus Christ was a refuge for his disciples then, and he is a refuge for you as his disciple today. Grace, in the midst of busyness, go to the true and better David and be still. Go to him and know that he really is your refuge. That's one. That's one. What is two? Two is this. When you are still before the Lord, you will find that he gives you a sense of belonging even despite your loneliness. He is a refuge in the midst of sorrow, but he gives you a sense of belonging even in the midst of your loneliness. David was a man who needed to know that he belonged. David was a man who knew sharp loneliness. In David's early life, he had to live on the run as the king hunted him. David either lived in caves or he even had to live at times with Israel's sworn enemies. He had to go and live amongst the Moabites. He had to go and live amongst the Philistines. David was a man who knew what it felt to be cut off from his people. David is a man who knew exile. He knew what it was like to live far from the tabernacle where he could go and enjoy God's presence. David knew what it was like to live as a rejected outcast. David knew what it was like to be lonely and alienated. He needed a sense of belonging in the midst of the loneliness. Yet here's the thing. David is a man who could be still and know that he belonged to the Lord his God. Oh, look at verse four. Look at verse four. Maybe my favorite verse in this whole passage. Do you see the change of scenery from verses one through three to verse four? Do you see the contrast? I mean, we've gone from roaring, destructive waves to a still river with life-giving streams. We have gone from shaking, trembling mountains to the city that sits atop a mountain, Mount Zion, David's calm Jerusalem. We have gone from a crumbling earth that gives way to the very serenity of God's 
holy dwelling place. Do you see how we've moved from chaos to order, from trembling to stillness? What a contrast. I mean, no wonder when you look at verse four that the people here are called glad. In David's day, in his latter days, after Jerusalem was founded, Jerusalem was the city of peace. It was a place you looked to and remembered God's blessing. It was a sign to all of God's people that they really did have a home. They had a place where they belonged. They had a promised land. They had his promised presence. They belonged. You look to Jerusalem, the city of Zion, that's what you're supposed to see. That's what you're supposed to remember. So even as David felt cut off from others and isolated, even when no one saw what he was going through, even though no one, no one knew that he felt unknown and he felt misunderstood, David could look to the place where God dwelled and know that he still belonged. There are those of us here this holiday season that will go through sharp loneliness. Some of you won't see family or friends because there's been rifts in the relationship or you've had to bury them. Some of you will face the holidays without a spouse. Some of you will face the holidays with the spouse, but it won't be the light touch of kind words, playful banter, or that fun little bump you give each other as you pass in the hallway. No, it will be heavy on harsh words and unmet expectations. You will feel empty, unloved, and alone, even in your marriage. Some of you will have many people around you, but you'll wonder if they see you, if they care, if they understand. If I could talk to our youth, I understand that you're probably wondering if we see you, if we get where you're at, if we really and truly know what it is that you're struggling with, and if we care. And here's the thing, can we just be honest? The holiday commercials, the holiday ads, those Hallmark shows don't help when you're lonely. They make it worse. Families sitting around the fireplace, laughing, wearing bad sweaters, never ever fighting over what we're gonna watch next on the TV, right? They paint a picturesque, just, just portrait of families and friends that's just not attainable. It's not real. Oh, like David, many of you know something of feeling all alone or feeling rejected. And in the midst of your loneliness, you need to hear these words. Be still and know that you belong to him. Be still. You know, when you're lonely, when you're lonely, stopping and being still can be very, very scary. We don't want the silence. Why? The white noise of busyness is easier, and it gives you the false sense that you're not alone. It gives you a brief reprieve of taking your mind off of your loneliness, and it keeps you from having to face the holes in your heart. How do I know that? I know that because I've lived it. Let me tell you about Christmas in 2006 when I was in Iraq. I remember most about that Christmas season in Iraq, the extreme sense of loneliness. I remember being in firefights on Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, and the day after Christmas. I had just gone from directly leading 30 men as a platoon leader to the second in command of 160. That meant I had more logistical responsibilities, more administrative responsibilities. I was more detached, even in our combat situations, I was more detached from the soldiers than I had ever been. I felt alone. I felt isolated. Moreover, I loved dearly my brothers at arms, the men around me. Oh, but they were knuckleheads. You know, I felt like I was the only Christian out of 160. I didn't want to watch the movies that soldiers want to watch when their wives are not around. Yet all the same, during the holiday season, what did their wives do? Sent care packages. What did their sons do? Sent letters, daughters, sent little drawings. I remember having to confront the fact that I felt like a failure because here I am and I don't have that. All of that combined makes you feel isolated, makes you feel different, makes you feel set apart in a bad way. So what did I do? What was my response? How did I medicate? How did I self-soothe? I worked long hours into the night. I hid behind the mask of being a good soldier who just wanted to perform well, but the reality is I just didn't want to go to bed. Why? Because as many of you know, it's when you go to bed that you have to face the loneliness. You can't get away from it then. And here was my deepest sense of loneliness. My deepest sense of loneliness was this. I was not home. 
I just didn't belong in that country. You know what I needed to hear most? And do you know what you need to hear most? We need to hear this. If you are in Christ, you are not alone. He is with you and you belong to him. You belong to God's people. You have a home and that home is not this world, no. We are exiles, we are aliens, we are sojourners, we are pilgrims just passing through as we head to the true and better Jerusalem above. Oh, Grace Church, when you think about that true and better Jerusalem above, you read in Revelation chapter 22, verses one and two, that it too has a river that makes its people glad. It too has streams, only they are streams of eternal life reserved for you to drink from. We can sip from those one day and it will make us glad. On that day, when you are there, you will look around you and you will see an ocean of brothers and sisters. You will see the face of Jesus and your loneliness will be a thing of the past. It will be gone forever. But still, how do you trust that? How do you rest in that? How do you know that it is real? You know that it is real, you can trust in it because the true and better David did not just come to be still in the manger. He came and he came to be still at his trial. He came to be made still in his death on the cross. Oh, David knew what it was like to be physically cut off from others. And in your loneliness, you know what it's like to be physically cut off from others. But the true and better David, Jesus Christ alone, knows what it is like to be spiritually cut off from God the Father. And if he was willing to do that for you, to be still in that way, then surely he will come to take you home and bring an end to your loneliness. Oh, grace, that day is coming. But in the meantime, what do you do? You remember this. You have his presence by his spirit. In the now, you have his presence. You can be still. You can go to him, you can talk to him, you can trust that he really is listening, he really is on the other side of that line of prayer. You can find that even now as you wait for that day, you are not alone. You are never alone. Oh, lean into that, be still, lean into that, and you will feel his presence. Grace, in the midst of all those people that aren't calling you or checking in on you, in the midst of all those infights that you don't get this season, be still. Find time to take your loneliness to him and you will find the sense of belonging that you need. Oh, do you see him? Do you see that he's good? Do you see why you should be still? Be still because he's a refuge. Be still because he gives you a sense of belonging. What's the third thing that we need to see in this text? We need to see that when you are still before the Lord, you have grounding despite your anxieties. You have a foundation. You have a center. Let's look at that. Oh, when you are still before the Lord, you will find that you have a grounding despite your anxieties. David is a man who needed a grounding, he needed a foundation, he needed sure footing in his life. He knew anxiety, he knew stress, and he knew it deeper than most of us in this room ever will. Did you know that once a hated foe captured both of David's wives? Here at Grace, we do not condone polygamy, let me just say that, let's get that out of the way. But David's two wives were captured and in the very same verse we learn about his wives being captured, we learn that his people wanted to stone him. His own people, the ones he came to save time and time again in battle, wanted him dead. We can see that in 1 Samuel 35 through 6. I think we have it up there for you. That's stress. It even says David was distressed, right? Moreover, Later in his life, once David became the king, he knew the weight, he knew the stress, he knew the anxieties of wearing the crown. There were always incursions from the Philistines or the Syrians or the Ammonites. He always had to go out to war and protect the borders of his people. There was the task of administrating the kingdom. There was a the task of bringing the kingdom back together after rebellion after rebellion. Yet David as a man who knew stress, who knew worry, who knew anxiety, David was a man who could be still and find that his grounding was secure in the Lord. Let's see that in verses five through seven. Go there with me. 
That contrast with verses one through three continues. The contrast with the uprooted mountains and the roaring seas, it it continues, right? Like in verses two through three, the mountains were moved, but in verses five through seven, God's people, God's city is not moved. It is not moved. They are not moved. No, Jerusalem would not be moved. She would not be shaken no matter what force came against her. The Lord God was always there to help her. His word His word is the power that determines their outcomes, not the power of the forces arrayed against them. In fact, let's do a little bit of a deep dive. Look in verse five, I think it's the final two words, that phrase, when the morning dawns, when the morning dawns. Did you know that that is an echo? That is an echo of something that happened earlier in the New Testament? It takes us back to Exodus 14 and the crossing at the Red Sea. It takes us back to God drowning Pharaoh and his army. Do you see that? It was in the morning watch, the early dawn, where God defeated the Egyptians. It would be in the early morning when God defends Jerusalem. Oh, grace, whether it was the stone walls of Jerusalem that surrounded God's people, or whether it was the watery walls of the Red Sea that surrounded his people, either way, It's always his strong arms forming a protective wall around them, keeping them safe, keeping them from being moved. They are grounded. They have a foundation. They can be shaken, but they cannot be knocked off of this foundation. And David knew that if this was true for God's people, then it is true of him because he is God's chosen king. He is secure. His footing is sure. So when anxieties, concerns, or scary things came David's way, he could be still and find that the Lord really was his rock and really was his grounding. This Christmas season, we all know anxieties, don't we? I hinted at it in the introduction. Let's unpack it a little bit more. We said that 88% of Americans experience stress during the holidays. Let's just break that down right? Like it might be work-related worries. How many of you have end-of-year quotas, end-of-year deadlines, end-of-year goals at work? How many of you are putting in extra hours to be able to afford that nice holiday meal or those gifts? Or to just make sure everything's in order at work so you really can take some time off? There may be financial cares. In that same survey I quoted, we found that 50% of Americans worry if they'll be able to afford any gift at all. We didn't even mention inflation. Several of you, oh man, several of you have added children this year, right? We've done a lot of baptisms here at Grace, and it's beautiful. It's awesome. We love it. We ain't giving them back, but are they expensive? Diapers, yes, (laughs) formula, right? Food, all of those things they need, and now the holidays are upon us. It might be shopping, related stress. We've talked about long lines and full parking lots, getting in at Costco, getting out of Costco. Did you know that 45% of Americans would tell you one of their greatest stresses during the holiday season is other shoppers? (laughs) That you, right? Like trying to find that gift before it goes out of stock and you see won't be available until January something or another. Anybody do that? Yes, we all do. There's family baggage. There's family baggage. There's old hurts that come up. There's unmet expectations from parents and children. And there's even the comparison among siblings and cousins of, well, how did so-and-so turn out? Why aren't you like them? Oh, man. There's schedules to line up, and that is a hassle. Anybody feel stressed just hearing that? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. (laughs) In the midst of your anxieties, you need to hear this. Be still. Be still and know that he is your foundation. Grace, your center, your foundation is not anchored in your ability to deliver that perfect meal. It is not grounded in how nice the gifts are or how many gifts you put under the tree. It is not measured by how conflict-free your family gatherings are, and you are not defined by how well put together your family is. You are no longer defined by what other people think of you, what they think of your shortcomings, your politics, your values, or your faith. Those things no longer define you when you are in Jesus Christ. No, when you take time to be still, 
All grace, you rest on his foundation. You are refreshed in the knowledge that your grounding is his unchanging love for you. You are grounded in his adoption of you as his son or as his daughter. Your center is this. He wanted you despite your failures. Not that he was impressed with you. Not that you did anything to make him like you. Not that you were more superior or more squeaky clean than the next door neighbors. No, he just picked you. End of story. He just wanted you. He loved you. And that's not changing. And if that right there is not changing, you cannot be moved. Your foundation is firm, and you are like Israel, where God's arms really are surrounding you. That's what you find when you take the time to be still and know that he is God. The words of verse 7 reverberate throughout the chambers of your heart. He is with you. He is your fortress. And you can take that to the bank. But one final time, how can you trust that? How can you know that you know that? How can you be grounded in his grounding? How can you trust that he really is your foundation? Oh, let's go back to the true and better David one more time. Do you remember how his people wanted to stone him? Do you remember how David's people spoke of ending his life? Well, if the people of God in the Old Testament spoke of stoning David, Jesus' people cried out, what? Crucify him. The words, be still, describe Jesus at his trial. They describe Jesus on the cross, but they also describe Jesus as he lay in the tomb. Only this time, those words, be still, would be reversed. You see, it was in the tomb where God raised Jesus from the dead, and he resurrected his son to new life. You can now look at the empty tomb and know this that if God the Father will do that for his son and you are united to his son by faith, then God the Father will do that for you too. You can rest in that and be still, knowing that your future is secure and you can be grounded there. Oh, grace, in the midst of your worries, in the midst of your anxieties, be still. Force the time in your schedule. Get in there and cast your cares upon him. Find in him your grounding and your footing, and you will not be moved. Grace, there is so much good that comes your way this holiday season if you take the time to just be still. There is hope, there is help this holiday season. Right, like he will, be a, he will be a refuge for you in the pain and the sorrows. He will give you a deep sense of belonging in the loneliness. He will be your firm footing as the anxieties and the stresses mount as your kids X off the days. But grace, one final thing. We have to be clear about what it means to be still. We have to be clear on this. We need some help with this. Our hands need to know, okay, what do I do to be still? Well, let's say what being still is not. Being still is not making sure you get a nap in. Being still is not making sure you get away to get some me time in. I don't mean be still and go through the family albums or listen to your favorite music and reflect on the good old days. By all means, do those things. I'm not bagging on them, but to have the true biblical sense of this psalm and the words, be still. We have to remember the goal. We are to be still so that we can know that he is God. And how do you do this? How do you do this? Four steps, four steps. We'll close with this. Number one, pick one of the points that you connected with. Pick one of those pain points, right? Like, is it a refuge in the midst of pain? Is it belonging in the midst of loneliness? Is it grounding in the midst of anxiety? Which one do you need the most? Take that one and let's, let's hold on to it. That's one. Second is you do this. You carve out a silent space and a silent time. It may mean turning off the radio or the podcast in the car. It may mean turning off the podcast as you're cleaning or working around the house. It may mean a little less night Netflix one night. It may mean giving someone else the opportunity to be still and taking their chores on for them so they can get out and go do this as well. 
Number one is you pick the pain point that you connect with. Number two is you find that silent space. Number three, this is gonna be hard, but you gotta do it. Reflect deeply on your pain, your care, your worry, or your loneliness. Go there. Embrace it. Don't put up a false front. Drop the defense mechanisms and just ask. Trace your sorrows. Trace your loneliness. Trace your worries. Ask, why is this hitting me so hard? How is this affecting me? How is this affecting me around other people? What fruit is this producing in my life? Ask yourself, what would change for the better if God's great love for me dropped all the deeper into the innermost parts of my heart? That's number three. So number one, pick your pain point. Number two, create silence. Number three, go deep with the pain. And then number four, go deep into his word. Go find those verses. Go find those stories where the Bible speaks to this. Go find the other stories and verses where he is a refuge. Go find the other verses and stories where you see his acceptance, his belonging, even of the misfit. Go find the other stories and verses where he gives peace. He offers peace, protection, or stability, even when people don't deserve it. Grace, there is so much power when you look at your story and allow it to intersect with his. But you got to be still to get there. So go and be still. Be still and know that he really is your God and that will make all the difference this holiday season. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we come before you, Father, needing to be still. Father, we don't wanna be still. We wanna get on with this holiday season. We wanna maximize it. We wanna be efficient. We wanna squeeze the marrow out of it and wring the orange juice out of every last bit of that thing that we can get, Father. Oh, Father, we want it drenched with fun times, but Father, that means that it is so hard to be still. Father, please help us to remember that you really are our refuge. You really do give us our sense of belonging. And Father, that you really do ground us despite all the stresses, worries, and cares of this holiday season. We love you, Father, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.